Nathan Watt, and today I'm going to be talking to you about my coaching plan. So today I'm going to talk about basically the history of coaching, give a brief introduction of coaching within football, or soccer as you like to call it. Uh, I'm going to talk about my two inspirations, Eddie Howe and Pep Guardiola. I'm going to move on to my own personal coaching plan before telling you how I think I can achieve this. So, starting with the history, obviously for those of you in this room, a lot of you have played sport for a lot of your career, and obviously you still do. Um, and speaking on behalf of football, a lot of coaching in the older days was always autocratic. So it's a case of, I'm going to tell you to do this, do that, it's either my way or the highway. You listen to what I say, and that's all that it is. Whereas nowadays, it's more of a cooperative style. So it's a case of, I'm going to help you, you're going to help me, and we work together. Now the best types of coaches have a combination of the two. So they know when the right time is to shout at you, or the right time to put a hand on the shoulder and give you a nice little pep talk in the ear and tell you exactly what they want to do. So a combination of both is the way it's going to go, and a combination of both is why the two coaches that I've picked are my inspiration. So, number one, Pep Guardiola. So for those of you that don't know, he's the current coach of Manchester City, he's coached at Bayern Munich, Barcelona, he's won league titles at the both, he's won the best com club competitions in the world in the Champions League, the Club World Cup, and individually he won the FIFA Coach of the Year in 2011. So obviously he's got success with his team and also success as an individual. So why exactly did I pick Guardiola? As a coach, he plays some beautiful football in the terms of the way we'd say it. A lot of pundits always say they play the beautiful game and his style is a, a basically a perfect example of that. They keep the ball, they press, they do everything that you want to see in an exciting game of football. So when people go to Barcelona when he was there, you knew what you were going to expect because you knew the way they were going to play. He was always consistent and he was a master tactician. But the reason why I love him so much is because after my research I found out how great he is at man management and the relationships that he's built. So the first example I'm going to touch on, I can't really say his name, but Pierre-Emile Hoberg. And basically for those of you that don't know, when he was at Bayern Munich, this player was in his youth team. He was 20 years of age and at this time, unfortunately for him, his dad was dying with cancer. Now Guardiola, being the man that he is, he took himself away from training, he went the extra mile and got to know the player a bit more. He went with him and unfortunately when his dad did pass away, the first person on scene was Guardiola and he was there crying with the player. Now obviously he did not have to do that, he did not have to go that extra mile, he did not have to show him that he was that kind of guy or that kind of support. Obviously I'm sure he had his family around him to do the same thing. But Guardiola is that type of manager who goes the extra mile to build that relationship, to make you trust him and make you want to play for him. And for me, that speaks wonders about the man. <coughs> Moving on to my next two points, obviously you'll see there's two players up there. Dani Alves and Yavi Martinez. One from Barcelona and one from Bayern Munich. So speaking with Dani Alves first, obviously that quote there says, he extends the individual chats every single day. Every day, whether it's a case of just saying hello, whether it's sitting down with you and talking about the game or the next game or whatever it is, he talks to all his players. So again, it's just a case of building that relationship and building that trust between you that you want to work for him. You want to work hard and he actually shows a genuine interest in you as a person. And Yavi Martinez is a brilliant example of that. He said he has an idea and knows how to teach it every session. He's incredible. And going off that, obviously, if you of you that haven't seen my report, in the report I talk about how on this quote, he talks about when he came as a player, he came as a centre midfielder, but Pep Guardiola changed that and moved into centre back. So he'd already established himself as a, one of the world's greatest centre midfielders, but Pep Guardiola said, no, I see you as a centre back. And obviously that was a big challenge, it's a completely different positional change, um, but in order to do it, he sat down with him every single day. He said he watched over 200 videos watching <laughs> defensive movement, defensive shape, defensive talking, talking about every single thing and every single detail that he would need to know in order to move into this position. And now, he re he's widely recognized as one of the greatest center backs playing the game at this moment and in the past few years. So for Guardiola, again, it was another massive take in the box at how his tactical work has actually helped in terms of building that relationship. Moving on to my second inspiration, and a coach that I'm slightly biased about because he coaches the team that I support, but it's Eddie Howe. So you can see he coaches Bournemouth right now. His previous coaching was at Burnley, and before that he came through the ranks and Bournemouth and coached on the first team, reserve team, before getting the head coaching job. He saved the club from relegation <coughs> extinction. The club was one game away from going completely bankrupt and disappearing. The game came down to it, whereas if they won, they kept going. If they lost, the club would disband and it would be no more. On that day, he said to his players, 
<clears throat> today you have a chance to make history, go out and do it. And they did, and today they keep fighting. Since then he's achieved two promotions in three years, taking up the Football League and into the Premier League, which is the highest league in England and probably one of the biggest football leagues in the world. He took them to the highest ever finish last season in the Premier League, and this season is on course to do exactly that yet again. And again, just like Guardiola, he also has an individual accolade where he won Football League Manager of the Decade in 2015, being the likes of Jose Mourinho, who just won the Premier League to the award. So obviously he's highly regarded in England, and he's also recognised as potentially one of the future England managers. So words can't speak highly enough about the manager. So similar to Guardiola, his <coughs> style of football. Pep Guardiola is widely known as one of his inspirations and one of the reasons why he coaches the way he does. So because of that, they obviously play quite a similar style of football. Not quite on the same level because he hasn't had the players at his disposal, but again, they play with a lot of attacking play, a lot of high pressure, and a lot of keep possession, keep the ball, will take the game to you. So I'll touch more on it later on in when I talk about me, but I talk about fearless mentality, and that's exactly what he's put into his work. No matter who they play against, whether it's the best team in the world or the worst team in the league, they go out and they play the same way. They try and keep the ball and they take the game to the opposition in exactly the same way that Guardiola does it, he does it at Bournemouth. Another reason why I love him is because of his professionalism. So I admire him on the field and off the field, but off the field when he's in the media room, when he's in a press conference, when he's found in the streets, wherever it is, he always presents himself in exactly the same way. He talks clearly, he talks professionally, and he does everything exceptionally well. He's never been the height of any controversy, he never says anything too controversial, and he respects his other clubs and his other managers. And the other day, going off that, before Bournemouth played Tottenham last week, there was comments about um, the Tottenham manager, Pochettino, and they were asking him, are you good friends? How do you feel about him? And his reply was simply, I respect him, he's a great coach, he's taken Tottenham to the next level, and obviously he rambled on a bit more. But at the end of the comment he said, at the end of the day, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to win games, and that's all it is. So I might respect him, but I still want to be. And for me, that speaks a lot about him. He's not going to talk bad, he's not going to big him up too much, but he's still a friend of him. In terms of loyalty, He's been at Bournemouth a lot, he left and came back, he sticks by his players. A lot of his players he brought from League 2. So obviously the Premier League is the top, League 2 is the bottom, so there's four leagues in between. In that time, he's had players playing in League 2 who now play with him in the Premier League. He's had players play with him in League 1 who are now in the Premier League and same from the Championship. Other teams will get promoted and they get rid of their players and they'll bring in a whole new squad for all this money. He stayed loyal to these players who brought the the championship and the success that they achieved in the lower leagues and give them the chance in the top league. And for me, that's all you want to coach. You know that if you work hard for him, he's going to give you the chances to keep going and succeed for him. And finally, again, I have a quote. Sam Francis is his, is his captain at the club right now, and it says that if you want to train for him, whether it's at 7.30, the lads want to train for him. And again, as a coach and an aspiring coach, that's all I want to hear from my players. If they want to come and train for me and work hard for me, then I'm obviously doing something right. If they don't want to train for me, then I'm not motivating them enough. Okay? If they want to work hard for him, and that's why they achieve the success that they have and the success that he wants to succeed with. <clears throat> so moving on to my SWOT analysis, I look at the strengths of the two combined, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats. So obviously it's clear to see, in terms of strengths, they both have brilliant people skills. They both know how to talk to the player and when they need to talk to them and what they need to say. In terms of their tactics, obviously they have an exceptional attention to detail. They know exactly the way they want to play and how they're going to play it. They set out with a game plan each game and they tend to stick to it no matter what. They can both be very flexible, but there's always a similar concept of we're going to keep the ball and we're going to press the ball. They're both well respected due to their professional mannerisms. Guardiola is quite similar to Eddie Howe in the fact that he's never really got too much controversy about him. He says it how it is, he respects the opposition, the referees, his players, and that's just the way it goes. Pep Guardiola, one of his key strengths is he's coached and played at the highest level. When he was at Barcelona, he played under Johan Cruyff, who for those of you that don't know, is probably one of the greatest players to play the game. Just recently, it had been his 70th birthday, and his, one of his former clubs named the stadium after him, just showing how even still he has that massive effect on the game. He changed the game in terms of the beautiful game and came up with the concept of playing this possession football and freedom. And Guardiola has literally learned from him as a player, taken that into his own coaching style, and now continues to show that to his other players. So for him, he has experience at the highest level coaching and as a player, which is obviously a massive strength. For Eddie Howe, 
one of the great things about him is he's been through every single stage of a career at Bournemouth. As a young fan, as a little boy, he was in the stands with a season ticket. He's experienced the emotion of the winning, the losing, the hatred towards the players. But at the same time, when he was growing up, he became a youth player at the club. He went through the academy, got given a pro contract, and started his career at Bournemouth. After unfortunately having to end his career early due to a bad injury, he then became a coach at the same club. And obviously now is the head coach. So obviously over the years, he's been a fan, he's been a player, and is now a coach. He understands every single aspect of the club that he works at. So for him, he, every decision he makes, he knows impacts all his lives, not just his players or himself or his coaches. It's the fans, it's the businessmen. He understands all of that. And for me, that obviously is an incredible strength to have. Moving on to the weaknesses. Eddie Howe did move away from Bournemouth for two years. He moved to Burnley Football Club, and unfortunately for him, fortunately for me, because he came back to my club, he didn't succeed. He didn't live up to the hype that he had at Bournemouth. He didn't give the same success. Although he wasn't given the same amount of time, he didn't quite get the expectations that he would have wanted to. He didn't get sacked, but he chose to leave and come back to Bournemouth. But obviously since then, he's taken to new heights, and like I said, he won two promotions in three years, which was an incredible feat. But weaknesses, as soon as he moved away, he didn't get the success that he wanted. And they're kind of the same with Guardiola. As he did, I'll tell you at the minute, Manchester City should be expected to win the league. They should be at the top of the league, but for their expectations, they're not quite performing the way they would want to. When Guardiola was appointed, the City fans said, well, we're going to win the league. And everyone expected them to do so, because when Guardiola was at Bayern Munich and at Barcelona, that's all they did. Every title, it was expected. Champions League, they would expect to win. Okay, he performed at that level, and now they expect the same. But now he's moved away, he doesn't have the likes of Lionel Messi, who's probably the best footballer of all time. He doesn't have the likes of him and his team. So maybe people look at him and say, well, maybe without these players, he's not quite the coach that we expect. Obviously, I don't think that because he's a brilliant coach, but I know there'll be some skeptics out there who will start to believe that. And the final point is, they both come into scrutiny for losing because they don't tend to change their tactics too much. They're both very flexible in the way that they change formation and positional, but in terms of the way they play, it tends to stay the same. Now, some will say that's a weakness, some will say it's a strength. I personally say, say it would be a strength because it shows that they trust their beliefs. They stick by it, but I know that some people will also see it as a weakness. In regards to the opportunities, obviously, like I said about Guardiola, he has an opportunity to become an elite member of a, a certain amount of coaches who have won the Spanish League, the German League, and then the English League. Okay, an incredible feat, but it's a chance that he has to do with Manchester City, and obviously he could win the Champions League at Man City and win with another team yet again. Same with Eddie Howe. If he continues to go the way he could, obviously, fingers crossed for Bournemouth, being a Bournemouth fan, he could win the league, but realistically, it's a case of cementing our place in the league and continuing to rise above the league and get our highest ever finish season after season after season until eventually become a well-recognized Premier League team. And again, in terms of the final point, international. Okay, they both got great success in the club level. If they were to then move into the international level, that could be one big, big step to cement them into coaching greatness. Okay, it's one thing being a great coach at the club, but if they could then go into international game and repeat this success, then again, it just makes them even better as a coach and would build that even, the, sorry, it would build the reputation that they already have and is already growing. My final slide of this one analysis is the threats. It's like I touched on before. If Guardiola isn't successful at Man City, will it tarnish his reputation? Football is such a fickle game in England, and because of the fans that we have, people will turn on him just like that. Everyone knows how good he's been and how good he can be, but if he doesn't generate the success at Manchester City, people will turn around and say, well, maybe he wasn't that good. Maybe at Barcelona it was the players. Maybe at Bayern Munich it was the players. We know it's not, but some people will think that. And obviously there's always that case in football, which I'll touch on again in a minute. You always have the fear of being sacked. It's such a doggy dog business. Okay, there's no loyalty these days in terms of owners and fans. If you're not getting success at the club one, then unfortunately you will be sacked and you will be replaced. So to conclude, what do I think is the best of them? Clearly their communication skills. They talk to the players and they do what they want. They play a management. They have that relationship to build and to move on and to make them believe that they want to believe in. And again, their professionalism and their football knowledge. They both understand the game, they both are at the top level and they're still trying to improve. They know they're not the finished article and even though Guardiola has been around for a longer time, 
they still want to keep working and improve and improve their philosophies that they have to generate even more success. The poorest five forces are pretty straightforward for the coaching world in the Premier League. So the buyer power, obviously the owners. The owners have all the money, they make all the executive decisions, they can hire you, sack you, give you a new contract whenever they want. In terms of supplier power, it moves on to the players. Oh, some of you would be sitting there thinking, nah, the players don't really have too much say in what will happen with the manager. I agree too, but in more recent events, Leicester City showed me what this actually can happen. Okay, so last year, for those of you that don't know, they won the Premier League, possibly one of the greatest achievements in football history. They were an underdog, a team expected to be relegated, and they won one of the biggest leagues in the world. Now this year, they did not live up to their expectations. They've been terrible and almost got relegated with the same coach, with the same players. So it came a point where their players turned on their coach and he obviously lost the dressing room. They went to their owners after a game and said, look, it's not working anymore. We need a new coach. And with that, he was gone. Coach was replaced, they got a new guy in. The next six games, they won six in a row. Now, obviously in the football world, everyone was quite disappointed with what happened with the Leicester players in terms of their loyalty, in terms of the disrespect that they showed to the manager that made them the players that they were. But it does show that players do have a say in what goes on in the club a little bit more than what you think. Threat implementary and threat substitution are kind of similar. There's always a chance of a new guy coming up or a new girl coming up, but there's also obviously that chance of you might be replaced by someone with a bit more experience or a bit more talent in the place that you're in. So that is always going to be there and that is never going to change. Industry rivalry is kind of what I touched on before with Eddie Howe. You either learn to love them or to hate them. Mourinho, a lot of managers will admire his skills and his passion that he has, but at the same time they will hate him because of his arrogance and the way that he conducts himself as a coach. But at the end of the day, it's a competition. You're not there to make friends, and that's the way you take it as a, as a coach on yourself. If you want to make friends, go for it, but at the end of the day, you just want to win. So, after talking about the two coaches and looking at what I want to build on, what do I say is my style of coaching? Where do I want to be? I want to be a coach that helps players grow. I want to make them a better player on the field and off the field. I want to build that relationship with them, just like the two coaches I've talked about. I want them to look at me as a friend, but also as a role model. Okay, I want them to come to me and understand that when they're playing with me and when I'm coaching them, that I'm going to get them better. They've got to believe in my beliefs and my tactics and the potential that I show with them that they can get to the level where they want to go up. It's not a case that they just turn her up with a kit on and train and we do an hour here, an hour there. It's a case of I'll invest my time if they invest their time into me. So with that, it'll be organized and it'll be professional. So I'll plan my sessions, I'll think them out, I'll do the research, I'll watch the videos, whatever it takes to plan a great session to find out how I can get the best out of my players on this given day, to work on positions, to work on tactical adjustments in a game. Whatever it takes, I will be organized and make sure that everything is prepared well in advance so that when it comes to an event or an emergency, I know exactly what it is I need to do. And again, with that, that means that I'm being professional. So professional like Eddie Howe. So if it's a press conference like this, if it's sitting in front of a, a group of fans and being questioned, I know what to say, I know how to get my point across, I know how to speak clearly, I know how to present myself in terms of dress code and um, talking to other people, whether it be Terry or a teacher or Tanya at the back, talking to a boss. I know how to talk to them, I know how to present myself and be the professional role model that I need to be so that my players can look up to me. So I'll move on to my actual coaching plan. Firstly, I'll talk about the on the field. So team mentality. I want to build in that belief that it's all for one and one for all. Okay, you work hard for me, I'll work hard for you. You work hard, I'll work hard. If it goes that way across the whole team, the whole level of pitch, the five or six that we have on the bench, you work hard for me and we work hard together. That's how you get results. Bringing in that fearless mentality and believing that no matter who we play against, whether it's the best team in the world or the worst team in the world, we are going to play the way that we want to play and we're going to get a result. Okay, and the two coaches that I talked about, that's the way they do it. They have their tactics and their philosophy and the players buy into it. If I can get that same mentality and that same belief in the team that I want to coach, then of course that's the way it's going to be. You go into game, you go, don't go, oh, it's Fifa, oh, we're going to lose. Or it's North Greenville, oh, I don't need to try today, it's an easy win. It's a case of, it's North Greenville, we put on performance. It's FIFA, we put on a performance. We have our tactics and we stick to it. And that's the way I always want it to be. So with that said, with their tactics, I want it to be high intensity and I want it to be confident. Confident in the belief that what we want to do is the way that we want to play. 
So we'll talk about it a lot in the training and off the field. So that when it comes to the game day, we are confident what we want to do. And some of you will be thinking, the last point, team individual goals. Well, that's the same in mentality. And it is, but at the same time, it's not. Because the way I look at it is, in terms of Terry, he always says to us, we get a little bit better each day. And for me, that is why you have the goals. The short-term goals add up to make the long-term goals become realistic. So I'll sit down with my team, I'll tell them what I expect and what I think they can achieve. And obviously I hope that they agree and they, I hope that they buy into it and I'll make them believe that that's what we want to do. But at the same time, I want their opinion. So if they don't agree, then obviously we'll sit down and I'll understand why. Or if they think that they can do even better, then again, we'll sit down and we'll discuss why. Okay, I want to have a relationship where we can bounce ideas off each other and build a team together. It's not me in charge, I'm not being that autocratic leader like in the past, I'm cooperative. I want to talk to them and get the best out of each other and the way to do that is through communication. So moving on to off the field. We want to build a player, I want to build a player who's as good off the field as he is on the field. So the way to do that is getting a high GPA. Succeeding in the classroom will build you for a future after college. Okay, football and sport is only a short career. You build the experiences and you build the connections, but you need to know how to conduct yourself off the field. So we'll have mandatory study halls. A chance to get the players together, learn from one another, see who's good at this, see who's good at that, and help each other. And that's a chance to get that team bond and then build that team chemistry. Okay, if I, look, if I go into a study hall today and I say, oh, I'm struggling my business, I know that I can go to Hacking. Hacking can help me. Okay, in my business classes across the year, he's helped me a hell, hell of a lot. Okay, because I know that he's good and I'm not particularly good at that side. Okay, whereas we have freshmen now who look at us and they go, well, what can I do for this class? How can I help you with this class? Okay, and that's the way it should be. I want to build that team chemistry where we're comfortable around each other to know that he can help me with this and I can help him with that. We're a team and we're trying to build that chemistry and along with that, I want to be doing team events like going out bowling, going to watch a film or watching a sport game or whatever it is. Anything where we can get the team together and build that friendship. Because at the end of the day, if you're at college, you're away from your family. And I see a lot of you in this room are international, or you don't live in Banner Rock, obviously apart from Don. But you come a long way and you don't have that family close by. So this family in this room and in your team and in your locker room, that is your family. So you have to respect each other and learn to become the best of friends so that you work off each other and build into that mentality that said of all for one and one for all. And obviously that comes up to my final point of being professional. Conducting myself in the right way in terms of the players and making them be on time, be punctual and work hard in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So how exactly will I achieve this? Firstly, I'm not ready to retire yet. I'm going to try and play myself at the highest level, whether that's in America or Australia or England or anywhere across the globe. I'm not really bored. I just want to play at the highest level that I possibly can so that going forward, I can have that experience to look back on. If I come in as a coach and say, I've played at this level instead of staying at this level, immediately I already have respect. It doesn't mean I'm going to be a good coach, but I have that respect because they go, wow, he's played at that level. One day I want to play at that level. And then I can relate that back to them and say, well, this is how you can do it. This is the experience that I got. I think you're good enough. I think you can do this. If you work on this part of your game, you definitely have the potential to get what it takes to get to this level or this level. So obviously going off that, I have to do research on top of that. I might not get to the level that I want to, but I might coach a player where I look and go, actually, he was a lot better than what I was. He has a lot more potential than what I did and what I actually did with my career. So how will I do that? I'll look at videos on YouTube, find out drills to do with defending, or attacking, goalkeeping, whatever it takes, looking at positional stuff, tactical stuff, reading books about Guardiola, Eddie Howe, Alex Ferguson, Mourinho, whoever it is who I can get ideas from taking all these strengths and putting it into my own game, my coaching game, and doing coaching badges to look at how I'm gonna build myself as a coach. In England, I did a couple of badges, like looking at youth sports and how I can conduct myself in the youth manner. So being here now, I need to look at coaching all the people, and adults and young adults and girls and males and whatever it is, and how I'm gonna conduct more tactics into a game and present myself in an even better manner. So in terms of how I'm gonna get there, I have four stages which I've identified as stepping stones in order to get there. Volunteer at school, a graduate assistant at college where I'm gonna be shadowing a head coach and an assistant coach, getting to know the ropes and seeing how they go about their business, moving on to an assistant coach, then ultimately to a head coach. Now for me, the beauty of this is, I don't have a time scale on that. 
because the beauty of it is I could go from being a volunteer all the way to head coach in the space of a year because in football you never know what's going to happen. It's all about opportunity and the connection that you have. There's nothing stopping me going from straight from the bottom straight to the top. But on the other hand, it might take me all the way through volunteer to grad to an assistant to a head coach. That just might be the way it is. There is no set in stone way to go about it. Eddie Howe took his job when he was 31. Players in the team were older than him. Okay? There's no limit to how early you can start coaching. And there's no limit to how late you can start coaching. And with that being said, I might even get to an assistant coach and go, actually, I love this job. I don't see myself as a head coach anymore, and I want to stick by that. Okay? So I don't want to say that I'm going to go through each one of them steps and follow it step by step by step. Because I might change my, my career, I might change my pattern, and decide that for me, this isn't coach of the way I want to go. So to finish today, what is my aim? My aim is to be a recognized collegiate coach who doesn't just improve players, but improves them both on and off the field, and not just recognized as a coach who gets the results. I want to build that relationship with my players, and I want to make them better people, just like Terry does with us each and every day. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.